Shalom. Welcome to the Jewish View. My name is Rabbi Nachman Simon with the Chabad House of Dahmer and together with my co-host Mark Warner to statewide news service, jbiztechvalley.com and now the columnist for the Jewish Press. Right, I have a column called Albany Beat, but what's more important today is our special guest, return guest, is Senator George Latimer from Rye, Westchester County, and he's a, a staunch Democrat, you might say. Uh, no wavering on that. But I also have to tell you that we have our 200th episode of The Jewish View today. And I'm so happy to have George as our guest. Uh, you sponsored the Kiddush for that's the... That's right. <laughs> is, so that's what we basically have here. So I really want to uh, say welcome to George. Sure. And nice to be with you both. And I want to show everyone the cake. And I it's also nice want to... Cake. Yeah, in case it, hopefully it won't... Uh, These three stooges are going... Yeah, don't drop it yeah. there. Hopefully yeah. it won't <laughs> drop. But I also want to thank Joe Allendato, who's our director and has been from day one, and also Joe Kniff, who's the, direct, who's the chairman of the PEG Oversight Advisory Board, which um, is the board that the panel that makes the rules and regulations, I guess, for this uh, studio. So anyway... Thank Thanks you to, to everyone. For yes. doing a good job. 200 shows in what, about a year and a half? A year and a half, yeah. So Beautiful. Very impressive. Quite the task. Very so impressive. I'm going to hand out some cake, some cake here Woody, for everyone. Now you're turning into a caterer. You're um, a news reporter now. He's the My first job was at a catering hall when I was <clears throat> 14. I, I, I think anyone. every Jewish person starts that way, like in the Catskills or something. Yeah. <laughs> every kid does something like that. I worked in a hotel for a while, too. So, George, you get the 200. There you go. That's very kind. Thank you very much. <laughs> I hope that my cardiologist is not watching this yeah. program. <laughs> right. And we won't yeah. send them the link either. No, okay? absolutely. <laughs> Thanks. But, uh, I'm on a diet too, Mark. You you're on that. a diet too. Well, here, we got a special cake for you. A rabbinical cake. And you know what? There you go. got to have some forks too. <laughs> <laughs> I gather we're going to be shown on the Food Network as well as yeah, uh, well. We got a special local access, a special hook to the Food Network, don't we? Uh, I suppose we do. <laughs> I suppose you do. You're talking about the governor's uh, main squeeze. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I talk about anything. <laughs> okay, now, so somewhere along can here, we, we yeah, do we have forks here. Yeah. Okay, well. We have forks. Okay. That's an old Theodore Burkell joke. Yeah. You know, you want a soup, where's the soup? And he says, it's right in front of you. Drink the soup. Where's the soup? Okay. Well, so he we, says, well, it must be that uh, no spoon. That's right. <laughs> so this There's is always something. for you, so. and we need another fork, and I can't get that fork. Well, so. I wouldn't worry about the fork or the okay. cake. I'm sure I'll have it in due time. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> okay. We can talk about whatever you want to talk okay. about, Okay. Now so, we have to talk to the real thing, the real All right, politics. but I want to have a, a bite of this cake because we, it took a lot to get 200 shows in there a year you go. and a half. So. Gentlemen, cheers. Mm. Mm -mm -mm. Oh, very good. Mm-hmm. Okay. Very good. Got my taste of it. Okay. There you go. Thank you. <laughs> okay. Now. Senator Latimer. <laughs> <laughs> Get down to business now. We're getting down to business. You are the uh, ranking member on the Senate Education Committee. Mm -hmm. And we have a lot of m issues coming down at the last minute uh, during the end of session. One of the issues is the what I used to call, but the governor renamed it, it was the Education Investment Tax Credit. Right. What did the governor rename it again? It was like the people's... Uh, Parental credit? choice, uh, yeah. something like that. Parental you know, there's choice. Al there's always a good marketing uh, way to describe these things. And since in my uh, corporate career I had a career in sales and marketing, uh, <laughs> I, I appreciate the value of it. It's picking uh, Don Draper over Perry Mason you know, in terms of a career choice. But uh, So it's repackaged, but it is, the, it is an, uh, a different version of the education uh, incentive tax credit program that's been offered a couple of other times before. Marty Golden, Senator Marty Golden, uh, and Mike Cusick, the assemblyman, have a bill uh, in mm -hmm. two, the two houses. The governor also put a version of it in the budget, which did not get adopted. But, you know, as an issue, it's still out there very much so. And how do you stand on it? Well, I support it. Uh, now, now, the provisions that the governor has put out uh, changes from what the provisions were in the, uh, you know, the main bill. And, and for this kind of an interview, I don't want to get too deeply in the weeds about all the different nuances of it. But basically what it does in principle and why I support it in principle is it allows uh, individuals to take a tax credit when they make a contribution to uh, a, uh, a school that has either as its uh, core religious institution 
or it can be also a charter school, and it could also be to a public education, uh, uh, education fund as created by most of these different school districts. I certainly in my district in Westchester have most of the school districts have an education fund. We're in a day of very tight finances in, in all different types of schools. And I've been an advocate for strong public education spending, and uh, I'm, I, as we may get into it, yep, you know, I'm certainly unhappy with the state not supporting the public school system sufficiently. Yeah, but but, but, but in addition to that, in addition to that, if I can just say, Rabbi, in addition to that, I see the need for robust public education and a robust private education. I do not think it's an either-or situation, and the people who choose one or the other I think are, are selling short the mix that's out there. And I have experience in my life with a sister who went to the parochial school system in the town I grew up in, and I'm a public school student from a, uh, an urban environment in Westchester County, the city of Mount Vernon, and I see the value of both systems being robust and strong. Hmm. Just saying the budget did uh, have an increase over a billion dollars for public schools. Yes, it was inadequate in my judgment. The Board of Regents called for a $2 billion increase and that was much closer to what you need. And the reason why I say that is that in our urban environments, uh, Albany is one of them, but not as impacted as, say, Buffalo is, as Yonkers and some of the other school districts, uh, we have uh, a significant need for pre-K across the board. The children who come out of certain socioeconomic backgrounds are not prepared on day one of kindergarten to, to perform and to function well. And New York City has pre-K. That was negotiated you know, in the budget a year ago. Uh, and so I think money needs to be set aside for that. But as I said, I don't put one thing at the counterpoint of the other. I think we need to invest in education across the board. So that's why I do favor the education incentive tax credit at the same time that I support a robust public education. Now, the chairman of the education department was John Flanagan, who mm -hmm. is now the Senate majority leader. Right. And did he, he had to give up his chairmanship. Yes. So who's the new chairman? Uh, Senator Carl Marcellino, also of Long Island, has been named by the Republican conference, the majority side of the aisle, to head the education committee. Wow. Because I'm the ranking Democrat. <laughs> and uh, we haven't met yet. But you know, I know Senator Marcellino. I've served with him in the three years that I've been in the Senate. And previously, I was in the Assembly for eight years. And we had some dealings on different issues across the board. Uh, he represents uh, a district on the North Shore of Long Island, next door to the one that John Flanagan represented. Right. And I represent a coastal district in Westchester, right across the Sound. So we have a lot of things in common on issues of the environment and uh, transportation and so forth. So we'll try to find common ground on education issues as much as we can. My, my basic demeanor, I know you call me a staunch Democrat. I'm a Democrat, and I'm proud to be a Democrat. But you work across the aisle. You try to find ways where Republicans and Democrats can agree on things rather than turn government into the demolition derby of partisanship. Well, you know what? I, I admire you for that because, you know, you were chairman of the Westchester County Democratic Committee, mm -hmm. so that's why I used the word staunch Democrat, right. and plus you were head of the Westchester County uh, Legislature. Right. So, you know, you have all these top political plum positions that you were in. I, I don't say condolences, I say congratulations, yeah. right? Um, there were plum positions that the, didn't carry a lot of compensation with them, though. Right, the, exactly. Uh, you know, the chairmanship but, of the party was zero compensation. <laughs> but they were very... You well, know, they were, they were but, important leadership positions, okay, and I'm glad that I had them in, exactly. in, in, that, in that era. And I know a lot of people, when they become chairman of a party, that they say, well, the only good opposite party label is a dead opposite party label, yeah. you know? Yeah. So I look at it as you being very reasonable in mm -hmm. the fact that you've got, you know, uh, the, uh, the D uh, running through your veins, but, you know, you still have the compassion where you can still right. Come pa get past that and still look at the, well, you know, on the I, Republican I would, side of the aisle. I, I would just tell you, I think that in Albany, uh, you know, which is a political city because yeah, it's the state right. capital, you tend to see things in terms of politics and partisanship. Uh, I spent 20 years in corporate America, uh, worked for subsidiaries of Nestle and ITT, and uh, in those places, uh, you know, you might hold your personal beliefs, your ideological beliefs, but you park them at the door. The job is to accomplish the mission. What's the mission? Grow revenue, produce profit, uh, introduce a product that's, that's appropriately marketed so that mm -hmm. the consumers buy it, et cetera, et cetera. And, and you don't let ideology get in the way of it. You don't sit there with somebody else you're supposed to work with and find ways to disagree. Or I'm going to blame him if this doesn't work. And that's the problem with partisanship. It's not that you, you, know, you, you sacrifice what you believe, but you recognize that whatever you believe, you still have to find a way to accomplish a task at the end of the day. And that task is more important than whether I get the credit or you get the blame or the reverse. It's very hard to argue that in, a, in the capital city. You know, uh, one of the things is the divide, I mean, you're talking about Democrats and Republicans, is upstate, downstate. Mm -hmm. And you hear that a lot. New York City is booming. 
What is, first of all, is the economy in Westchester? Is it more a suburb of New York where you're doing well, or it's like more upstate where it's hard times? Well, you know, I would, Westchester's doing well in comparison to most of the rest of the state. Uh, we are uh, the suburb just north of New York City, and if you go back to the 1960s and 70s, many of the major corporations in New York City decided to move their corporate headquarters out to Westchester County. So we have in my Senate district the headquarters of IBM, the headquarters of PepsiCo, mm -hmm. the headquarters of MasterCard, and they're all within about a five-mile range of each other. So those are tremendous economic drivers uh, that, that are in Westchester County. You have in White Plains a city of about 55, 60,000 people. And if you, uh, if, if you go there, it's, it, it is north of New York City, to be sure. But other than Saratoga Springs, I don't think you'd find a, another community that's got the nightlife and the energy of a White Plains. And it's really because of the proximity of, of New York City. If, if, if Westchester County was positioned where Dutchess County was, we wouldn't have the economy right. we do. So it is an outgrowth of New York. But as Goldilocks walked, Goldilocks walked into the Three Bears you know, a cottage, she saw a porridge that was too hot, porridge that was too cold, and porridge that was in the middle. And many times, that's how we as suburbanites view ourselves. Uh, we have certain links with New York City. We have mass transit issues, as New York City does. Uh, we have issues of high cost of taxes and, and issues that link us to New York City. But we also have issues that link us to the rest of upstate. Our structure of government is like uh, Albany County structure of government. We have a county government. We have cities and towns mm -hmm. and villages. We're not New York City. There's one monolithic local government that mm -hmm. has control over all the services. So in, in, in other types of issues, uh, tax issues, we, we link much more closely with uh, you know upstate communities. Now, upstate in the Hudson Valley, when you start getting to the western part of the state, you see the divide is not just upstate, downstate, but in the corridor between New York and Montreal, you have some vibrant cities. I mentioned Saratoga Springs, Lake George Village, Lake Placid. Glens Falls is having a renaissance. There are elements of Kingston and Poughkeepsie and, uh, th that are starting to show stronger effort. Hudson is a little community that's starting to get stronger. Peekskill. Albany has nanotech. Also. Right, and, and Albany has got a, a very strong economy given both the state capital and the, and the business and the uh, educational institutions around Albany. When you go west of that north-south strip, you have problems in Elmira, Binghamton. in Binghamton, in uh, to some degree Syracuse, certainly in Rochester. I was involved in some uh, uh, early 1980s development, hotel development in, in Rochester, and in those days, Rochester had a booming Kodak, sure. a strong Xerox, it had an IBM presence, Bausch & Lomb, French's Mustard, uh, and it was a white-collar city compared to, say, Buffalo, which was a blue-collar city, right. a steel and coal <coughs> uh, 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 Great Lakes community. Now Rochester has fallen on very difficult times. So, so to answer the question, we're doing well in the suburbs outside of New York City in comparison to the rest of the state. Nothing is ever as good as you want it to be. We have our pockets of problems in certain municipal areas, and we have our urban problems in parts of Westchester County, parts of Yonkers, Mount Vernon, Peekskill, and so and, forth. And northern Westchester, do they still have farms in northern Westchester? Well, is you know, there an agricultural <laughs> community? Uh, it's rural based on a, an urban concept of right. rural. But, but to, mean, come up, to come up you know, further north, uh, you would see it really as a, a suburban uh, area with lots of land, horse farms and Pound things Ridge that... And yeah, Pound Salem. Ridge and Bedford and, and North Salem are very affluent areas. So they're rural in the sense that you drive down a country road and you see greenery, but the value is very high for the land there and uh, so you're not, not as be... many working farms and okay. you don't have that type of rural poverty concerns that you have when you get to other parts of the state. I so see. we're very fortunate. But on the other hand, we're not exactly New York City. Upstaters view us as downstate. We never use that word when we describe ourselves. And when we are uh, in, New in Manhattan, yeah. they think that we're upstate and you know we're right next door to Schenectady. So <laughs> it's all a question of perspective. Well, I know that when I went, I grew up in Brooklyn. When I went up to college at U Albany, uh, I went back and visited my friends, and they said, "Now wait a minute, Albany? That's near Buffalo, a lot of or is that near Montreal?" Them. Yeah. And I'm like, well, Mo Buffalo and Montreal, first of all, are not too close together. And Albany is the same distance to New York City as it is to Montreal. Well, and, you've seen that you know, iconic, you gotta, yeah, you've seen that iconic New Yorker poster right, yes. in which you're seeing uh, <laughs> uh, 7th Avenue, 8th Avenue, 9th Avenue, 10th right. Avenue, the Hudson River, Jersey, Chicago, and Vegas, and L.A. Yeah. You know, as if, as if it's just right beyond the other side of the Hudson. <laughs> and, and that's reflective. And, and let's be candid. When you're in Manhattan, not even the rest of the city, the outer boroughs, because in the Bronx you call Manhattan the city. That's we're right. We're going into the city. We're going into Manhattan. Mm -hmm. When you're in Manhattan, you have a world-class city for which, in my judgment, there's no equal. Mm -hmm. There are wonderful communities, London and Paris and Hong Kong and so forth. But 
There's no equal to New York City. It is, it is a place unto itself. And it's very difficult when you're in that heady environment. It's the headquarters of finance. It's the headquarters of the news media. Mm -hmm. It's the headquarters of fashion. Mm -hmm. It's the headquarters of advertising. All of these Broadway, major, right, Broadway theater entertainment. Yeah, yeah. It's very hard to say, well, the decision makers in New York are also going to be sitting in Albany, 150, 200 miles to the north, and they're going to be representative of some smaller communities around the state, and they will sit in judgment on rent stabilization, and they will sit in judgment on a host of other issues. So from a New York City perspective, uh, it, it can be difficult to look at the rest of the state, unlike New York City, and say, why do you have any control over us? We are New York City. We're this world-class community. But that's the way it's been structured, and uh, we work through it. That's okay. all you can really do. So how, now, we had uh, recently, it was announced that Mary Ellen Ilya mm -hmm. was announced as the new education commissioner. Right. Have you got, do you know about her? No, I, I don't. I mean, I've read that the announcement came a day or two ago. Are you going to and, ask her uh, to come before the committee? Well, we expect her to come before the committee. Now, we're, we're close to the end of the legislative session. So? And, and that may or may not, there may or may not be time to I mean, do she that. Doesn't, no, she doesn't officially take office until July 6th, right. so which it, is it, after session. Yeah. So, so my expectations, and this is the prerogative of the chair, Senator Marcelino, but I would certainly support uh, if he calls a special meeting of the Education Committee to meet with her and, and you know, talk to her about her ideas. I think she's probably going to want to get settled mm -hmm. into uh, Washington Avenue down the street well, she had and, no and start the process. She had no idea what EITC was. The right. She thought, she was, is that a voucher system? Yeah. And I went, no, it's no, not. It's not a and then system. someone else... You asked chimed questions, in. Mark? Yes, yeah, really? yeah. Was gonna, and I yeah. and you know they had a uh, a staff person whisper and say, right. no, it's when you give a contribution, you want a tax credit for the contribution. And, so there's going to be know, a lot of learning. But curve. a big learning curve, and you know, well, it, from, it, from everything our, I've read, I think yeah. our state education budget is larger than the entire state of Florida's budget. Well, I don't, it might be. I mean, Florida's a big state now as well. It is, but but, but I'll take your you know I'll, I'll take your counsel on the on the numbers. Yeah. But the bottom line is this: she was most recently superintendent of the Hillsborough County Public Schools, which, which is, is near Tampa, Tampa, Tampa right. area. Uh, coming in to take over the state system, you're coming in not only in a large jurisdiction, but you're coming in at a time of uh, controversy mm -hmm. and a time of change. And uh, some of the things that uh, the governor's advancing, some of the things that other academics are saying or the changes that are needed in the system are, are very debatable. Uh, you know, one man's reform is another man's wreckage, depending on whether you agree with the direction or not. Uh, I've been a critic of uh, high-stakes testing. I think that uh, the model which started uh, yeah, in... Common Core just... Well, I, common, I common Core is... It just was high stakes. Yeah, common Core is sort of the, the, the cap that they put on all the changes that have happened in education. What Common Core specifically is, is a change in the standards uh, for uh, acceptable graduation mm -hmm. uh, at, at the high school level. But what Common Core also is a series of steps that get you from, say, third grade to 12th grade with that level of uh, higher rigor. Built into that is high-stakes testing in which the, the act of taking tests in English language and mathematics uh, ca carries uh, much greater weight in the child's advancement and then also now connected to the teachers in the teacher's evaluation and the administrator's evaluation. But this came in pieces. Uh, President Bush was the advocate for no child left behind. Mm. By the way, great marketing slogan, who wants to leave a child behind? That's right. You know, No child left behind in essence was the high stakes testing component of this. Uh, President Obama and Arnie Duncan, his secretary of education, added to it, the here's another acronym, APPR the professional uh, review uh, process that, that we are debating now as to how it should be constructed, in which the high stakes testing results for the kids counts for the teachers as well as some percentage of their evaluation. Uh, and uh, that connection, which came with the Obama administration, also came with money. And you may remember, Mark, because you were covering the legislature in 2010, we had a very bad budget year. It was the budget year that followed the Great uh, Recession of 2008-2009. State was bereft of revenue. And uh, there was the federal government holding out $750 uh, you know, million dollars in, in aid if you adopted these standards. And, and we had a budget that didn't close until August, if you recall. And one of the pivotal ways it closed was with this additional money. But you made a commitment to do certain things with that mm -hmm. money. And while it wasn't clear at the time we accepted the money, it became clear thereafter that it involved embracing this change in the way education is delivered. And so now you, you have to step back and look and say, are we happy with what we're doing? Is this the right path? 
And each of these issues, we started out talking about the EITC, uh, high stakes testing, the uh, uh, annual performance review, issues relating to tenure, issues relating to termination of teachers uh, for you know some valid or cause, in theory a valid cause, and each of these different bullets, there's about another five bullets, all of these things are part of the mix that's swirling right now mm -hmm. in, our, in our education system. And education is the second biggest piece of our state budget. That's right. We have a $142 billion budget, over $50 billion of it is healthcare, primarily Medicaid, over 30 billion of it is aid to education. Mm. And if you're in some districts, either rural and certainly the urban districts, uh, you know, the, uh, the problems that they have in part is money and in part other things. And, and so and they look to the state for solutions. And the new commissioner didn't, get a, didn't do very well in her last year or so. I mean, she was saying, uh, justifying her existence <laughs> at Hillsborough, saying, well, most superintendents last maybe four years. Mm. And she lasted 10. And it was the last year that they didn't get along, and she got bounced out by a four to three vote. So it wasn't overwhelming, right. but she did get bounced out. Well, you, and, and, and what it you was have just to add personality because of yeah. the high stakes testing, right. and it was how she didn't express herself the right way, you know. And the board that voted her out right. wasn't the board that voted her in. Well, that's that, that's so. part of it. You know, you have uh, in many cases elected school boards. And when you have an election campaign, from time to time, members come in as part of a team of people to defeat the people who were in already, and they come in with a desire to change things. And, and in theory, with an election, they have some voter support for that change until they go before the electorate again and confirm whether the electorate liked the change that they delivered. And so, uh, as much as I've read, but I haven't had a chance to talk with uh, the new commissioner about it, uh, that's part of the, uh, the narrative that she brings into the door. What happened? Why did it happen? How did it happen? I don't presume, Mark, uh, anything until we have a chance to talk, until we have a chance to do more homework. She was announced a couple of days ago. I know. Uh, and now people are scurrying through uh, clippings online to determine who she is. I'd rather, and I'm sure, Rabbi, you do this all the time, I'd rather meet the person well, and talk sure to them that. and draw a judgment over time, not a snap judgment. But do you like the process that it wasn't transparent, that maybe it didn't have to be transparent, but would you have liked it to have been more open and less secretive? Well, I mean, of course. Uh, and, and, and here's the, well, here's the reason why. Here's, here's the reason why. Uh, we had in the prior commissioner, John King, Dr. King, a person who's very controversial. He came out of the charter school experience. He did not have a lot of classroom experience. He was not superintendent of a school district either in New York or elsewhere. And then you immediately are at the top of a pyramid. At the top of that pyramid, you are executing major change in the way education is delivered. But you need to have the understanding and ultimately the buy-in of all the stakeholders in the system if you're going to create change. If you came in as a baseball manager, let's say you want to turn around the New York Mets. They're getting a little better, but they're still pretty lousy. <laughs> I'm a Mets fan. You want to come in and change the Mets. You, you come in and you, you assess the players and you make some moves, some personnel moves. There are a couple of players who are the players who are already there and they're performing well. And you want them on your side for the changes you're going to move. So Matt Harvey, the pitcher, right. and David Wright, the third baseman. Uh, you're going to want to develop some relationships with before those changes come in. And I don't think uh, that Dr. King exerted the right balance in making those mm -hmm. changes. And, and the proof of the pudding is as you travel the state, they had raucous public sessions where parents were very upset over this. You have, you have you know, soccer moms have come to me and said, my children come home, they're crying, mommy, I don't want to go to school, mm -hmm. well, it's no fun anymore. And, and what I worry about, it's not if it's fun or not, but, but here's a valid question that I ask myself. When I was in school, uh, teachers took us on an outing to the Botanical Gardens in the Bronx, which right. was a wonderful experience. I loved it. And you're talking about uh, biology and plant life, and now you go see it in person. It opens your mind. You know, we created a program in the Westchester County Legislature, which we brought uh, young people in uh, so they could sit in the seats of the legislature and run a sample legislative session with age-appropriate issues, things that they could talk about at, at fifth grade or ninth grade level. Those types of things are not part of the testing module that you're going to be judged on. And teachers are not going to do those kinds of things if they have so many days to cover a certain curriculum right. and for the kids to be drilled and then to respond on a test. And that's what I worry about because not every kid learns adequately well through the lecture and test format. Mm -hmm. Some kids learn by doing, by touching and feeling mm -hmm. and seeing. And, and so my concern in, in all of this mishigas of, uh, I know, a couple, yeah, okay, a couple of Yiddish words, um, uh, yeah. re revolved around education. 
Are we, are we trying to change things because we have a vision and an ideology and academic philosophy, or are we in a real world change where we're analyze, we, see, we analyze reality, we see needs and problems, and we adjust what we're trying to change to the problems and the needs that we have? My business experience taught me not to walk into Project B with everything we did in Project A and apply the same standards understand the unique dynamics of Project B and customize, using your life experience, customize the strategy for Project B that may not exactly be what you did in Project A. So those are the concerns I have, but basically I'm an optimistic person. I haven't met the new commissioner. I wish her the best. I hope she comes in with her experience in life work and at the same time that she looks and she listens, Maybe she learns a little bit, maybe I learn a little bit, and out of that we have a good experience. Well, I'm hoping her experience in the last year of her tenure at Hillsborough right. was a teachable moment for her, no pun intended. Well, but, you know, and that she can move on and learn from that and not make the same mistake. I, I'm sorry, I just wanted right, to ahead. ask yeah. you about the, um, uh, about her. Uh, can I just, yeah, uh, before, because on your note, I totally agree with you hands on. For example, when a history, I mean, we're in Albany, you learn about the Revolutionary War, go out there to Fort Ticonderoga. Right. But you have to read a book for, you know, if you're right here. And uh, just that hands on makes it alive. And we try to do that in Judaism yeah. also. Right. It's a living thing. But just, uh, I know we're very few minutes, and Mark also has a question, but just almost like the practical issue, the dropout rate in high schools, now I don't know what it is in Westchester, but I, we had the superintendent of Albany schools at 50%. I heard it's Rochester, like you say, is, uh, has troubles, and right. troubles in school, 10%. I think there should be more, like you say, hands-on vocational there also. I, I would Teaching I would everybody agree. physics and chemistry, Obviously, it's turning them off. They're not continuing with school. Uh, you know, academics uh, are not the path for everybody. There, there is a perfectly workable career to have working with your hands, car mechanics, oh, uh, carpentry, plumbing, uh, masonry. My father was a maintenance man who had some skill in those areas. Uh, my mother was a factory worker. The fact that I grew up and became a white-collar person, I'm the first in my family, followed by my sister. Uh, but that was not... Uh, you know, the, the agreed upon path until you determined that was the way you wanted to go. One of the things I wanted to ask you about yeah. was, um, you know, you look at uh, Dr. Steiner and you look at Dr. King and now you look at uh, the, you know, Mary Ellen Ilya and hoping she's Dr. Ilya. Well, we'll call uh, her doctor until okay. we find out otherwise. Uh, but you look at, you know, before Dr. Steiner, they were all white men mm -hmm. and wasp. Now you have you had a Jew, you had a, a, a female, you had a black, you know. So I'm waiting. We had Carlos Carbolata, who was yep. there briefly. So <laughs> I'm just wondering if all of a sudden now in the past generation, uh, past 10, 15 years, if maybe there's more of an idea that you need to uh, be more diverse in terms of who the commissioner is. Well, you know, and I, I, it just seems ironic that, yeah. you know, you had 150 years of white male and, right. and wasp, and now you have this, uh, and you look at the Hall of, the Hall of Chancellors. Well, Mark, Mark let me comment amazing. before my time is done, and no. certainly you can cover these things on your next program. You, you've <laughs> had an African-American president, an African-American governor yeah. uh, in the last few right. years, which was inconceivable 30 or 40 years sure, ago, much sure. less 100 years yeah. ago. So the pool is opening. Uh, the, the, the prescription of not having a person to this or to do that is changing. Elliot Spitzer was our second Jewish governor after Herbert Lehman. Uh, and of course, we've had uh, somewhat greater diversity in a lot of different positions. But I think we're trying to get, in my judgment, to what Martin Luther King Jr. wanted us to get to, which is judging people on the content of their character rather than on the color of their skin or their dynamic, uh, ethnic dynamic. If you walk in the door, your ethnicity shouldn't be held against you. It's something to celebrate. I am not Jewish, but I celebrate. I have many friends who are Jewish, and mm -hmm. we enjoy each other's company, and, 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 and you bring something to the table coming out of that life experience, so you're not eliminated anymore right, from right, consideration. Right, 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 right. On the other hand, I don't think trying to, to fill a box and check it off is the answer. You want the right person. And that right person might be female, it, it might be African American, it might be Latino, it might be anybody. And that's what we should be striving for, to right. find the, the best person. I didn't know how to ask that question at the news conference without having half the reporters throw their 
pens at me and right. daggers at me, so I just left it alone. But I figured while we're here, I might be able to ask your sage well, look, advice. Look, it's a legitimate question. Yes, my you know, my responsibility is uh, so to sensitive. swing at the pitch you throw me, you know. They're not so to, uh, sensitive about this stuff. Well, and people, people are. Look, I mean, I am, quote, unquote, a white male. <laughs> I am straight. Yeah. I am Christian in a society that is majority Christian, and you would say, oh, I'm part of every majority group you could think of. But that doesn't mean I automatically think just like every other white male, yeah, right. you know, right-handed <laughs> uh, senior, I forgot to say senior over 60, every one of those guys. I think the way I think. Okay. And, 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 and I treat you, uh, right. and Rabbi, meeting you today, I treat you as the individual you are, not just as a representative of your demographic. Right. And, and I think that's the America we want. And we, you know, we're a little closer today than we used to be. We're not there yet, but we're trying every day to treat people based on who they are and how they act, not on the, the, the package that they come in. That's excellent. a great way to leave this. Yeah, yeah. it was an excellent uh, end note because I totally agree with that. And I think that is the American way. And Senator, you're doing an incredible job. Thank and you we continue much. with success and with everything you want to do it with good health. And Thank I, you. Let's celebrate with cake. All right. And I appreciate <laughs> so our maybe friendship. Make a Thank, you. Over here, right. Right. <laughs> Thank you very much. And I'm glad you were our guest for the 200th episode. My pleasure.